Again, we're looking at this Uber driver who did say nothing suspicious, nothing happened that night, but, but wondering why he wasn't questioned earlier by police. Is this yet sort of another instance, perhaps, of something slipping through the cracks, an investigation that isn't quite going um, the way that we would hope it would? You know, look, it's always easy to be sort of a Monday morning quarterback, right? You know, I faced that when I worked counterterrorism on the day of September 11th um, at the CIA. Of course, everyone's critical about what you did or didn't do. But I do think here, these are just regular investigative steps um, that probably should have been taken that don't take really the FBI or other law enforcement organizations to come in. Those are things that you should know to do. You know, seizing uh, CCTV, asking that it not be recorded over immediately. Things like looking at their apps, looking at who took them home. That really should have been honed in on um, right away. So I do think that that is probably a step uh, that law enforcement missed. And I know that, you know, the Uber driver said that their behavior was, I guess, unremarkable. And that is remarkable in and of itself. That is important to know. Um, and I, I, I really just think, though, I think on the, the flip side of that, the fact that they still have not released the crime scene um, after six weeks is is interesting to me. And in, in a way, I'm actually glad uh, that they haven't, that they're taking their time to go through that. I know that's frustrating to some people. I have never worked a crime scene that's been held for six weeks. That's a really long time. However, um, you know, just a few days ago, we saw people going in and out with what looked to me um, like evidence retrieval boxes. And so I think that that's really important that they haven't done that. So they've done some things, I think, really within protocol um, and other things not within protocol. Interesting. And, and you mentioned, you know, it is remarkable that uh, there was that there was nothing remarkable that night, that the girls seemed to be behaving normally. In, in your investigator's mind, what is remarkable, remarkable about that? What can we infer? So there's a couple things that I would infer for that. First, the girls didn't think that they were in danger. They had had no interaction that evening, wherever they were, whether it was a bar, the food truck, walking around downtown, all the places that we've seen them. They had no reason to believe um, that their lives were in danger and that they had crossed paths with anyone who made them feel in danger. And so I think that's important and that potentially, I'm not saying that it will, but potentially it could rule out anyone that they would have come into contact with that night um, as a potential suspect. So I think that is a critical piece. I think also what this may tell us is that, you know, the suspect either entered in um, after they were already in the, the house or perhaps was laying in wait inside the house. So this was someone that may have been known to them, but not someone that they perhaps came into contact that gave them sort of a, a feeling of danger that evening. Really appreciate that. Thank you. And we just heard from our reporter, Alex Capriello. Now, a professor at University of Idaho is suing that TikToker, uh, that TikTok user who accused her of the killings on campus. Do you believe that the Internet sleuths had taken this too far? In this case, I do. Um, and I'm sorry to be so harsh and, and blunt about that, but the reality is, is the internet lives forever. Whether or not this professor is cleared, um, it, she will always have this when people search her name, and that is incredibly damaging um, to her um, and to her potential career path. And so I think we need to be very, very careful when, when naming names. And I think also this takes police focus perhaps off of this investigation. Right now, it looks to me like this is a civil um, lawsuit, but if they decide to go forward with criminal charges, you are now asking Moscow PD to investigate this as well as the murders of, of these four victims. And so I think really you're, you're tying the hands of law enforcement in doing this and you are potentially um, damaging this person's career forever. You may have feelings um, about who you think the murderer may be and that's okay, um, but we can't put that out there without evidence, without an indictment in a space that will, will live on forever. I appreciate that and it's true, the internet has such a long memory. Is there anything officials or law enforcement can do about the spread of misinformation or accusations online, or is it incumbent upon people like this professor to defend their own reputation? That is an excellent question. I think it's really hard. To me, the internet is like this leaky sieve of data, right? You know, it's really, really hard to warn internet sleuths. And, you know, one of the things that they can do to, to make it be taken more seriously is press criminal charges against this person um, who, who is basically naming this professor by name. But again, you run the risk of now you are deflecting from this active murder investigation to pursue these criminal charges. So criminal charges are one thing that you can to can do to deter this type of behavior. Um, however, I do think that the onus is upon people um, to not be engaging in, in this type of very specific behavior. It's okay to, to, to think about what you think could have been missed or what you think could have happened, but it's not okay to, to name names without any kind of criminal indictment.